Hi beautiful souls, it's Tan here today and I'm really excited today because I'm going to be starting a new series alongside my Neptune series and this new series is going to be on the 12 houses. I was thinking about you know talking about the 12 houses and I felt really excited so you know just want to get started on it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I actually got inspired to do this series from a very popular um, YouTube astrologer YouTuber out there and her channel's name is Hannah's Elsewhere. So I'm pretty sure that most of you would kind of know her because she's very popular. So shout out to Hannah. <laughs> yeah, so the way that she did this um, series was that she actually talked about um, her experiences of each of her houses, all right? Um, but yeah, but the way I'm gonna be doing this is that I'm gonna kind of be talking about each of the houses first, explaining each of the houses, and then I'll talk a little bit about my experiences of that house, you know, what I've got going on in each of the houses, and how that's been playing out in my life. And I hope that you guys are going to be able to take away something from that and kind of apply the way I interpret my own house placements to interpret your own house placements. Yes, so today we're doing the first house. So, have your nail chart in front of you, all right? And leave a comment below telling me what sign is actually ruling your first house and what planets do you have in the first house. So the way I see the first house is I see it being the, the house of self-awareness. So the way that you are going to approach your self-awareness in your life is going to depend on the planets that are in your first house. That's going to show the actions that you would take to achieving your self-awareness. And especially if you have planets in the first house opposing the seventh house, that's going to increase this um, energy of wanting to achieve self-awareness in your life because the seventh house is a house of relationships with other people and we've got planets opposing each other in that section of your natal chart it means that you are going to be able to gain self-awareness by yourself first house but also gain self-awareness through other people so it's like blown up self-awareness kind of uh, theme in your life right so the first house is also the house of your physical body and your, your physical appearance and your personality, okay? So I actually made, so the ascendant sign is the sign that is on the cusp of your first house and the sign that is ruling your ascendant, that is the sign that's ruling your first house. So if you look at your natal chart, whatever's your ascendant sign is the ruler of your first house. And I have made a video explaining about the Ascendant, so I'm going to leave a link up there and in the description box below as well. So you can have a look at that, I go into more depth about what the Ascendant is. Basically in that video, just to give you a brief overview, I basically talk about a baby chick hatching out of the egg, because that's what the first house is doing in your life. It's, um, it was how you came out of your mother when she gave birth to you and that situation surrounding that birth is imprinted in you causing you to behave the way that you know to behave in correspondence with that situation okay throughout every new situation that you experienced in your life so every new situation that's the personality that you take on okay so in a way the first house is also the glasses that you put on and the, the color of the lens um, in which you see the world through, okay? So you have any planets conjunct your ascendant, which means they should be within 10 degrees of your ascendant, that's gonna show you the situation at the moment of your birth, how you came out, <laughs> okay? and. The planets in the first house and the sign on your ascendant is very easily seen by people in the world and it's also very easy for you to access those energies and become aware of those energies. So in a way I would say that the first house is who we are and how we use our personality to meet life. It's the archetypes, you know, out of the 12 archetypes, right? It's the 
the archetypes, you know, the 12 archetypes corresponding to the 12 zodiac signs, it's the particular archetype that we choose to meet the world with. We, we choose to make that our personality and we meet the world with that archetype. And hence, the world responds to us in the way that we are putting out our personality to the world. So therefore, the Ascendant becomes our life's journey. So the way we develop, so the way that we develop and our way our first house work is first, it is how we perceive the world based on, you know, the moment of our birth, which then causes us, okay, because we perceive the world in a certain way, it causes us to choose certain personalities and archetypes, not necessarily conscious, all right? We choose certain personalities and archetypes and we act out according to that. Then it became that the world perceives us in the way that we choose the personalities and the archetypes. The world will perceive us that way. So then the world is going to respond to us in that way. Um, in the way that we are putting out those energies, which then causes the, the first house and the rising sign, the ascendant sign, to become um, the way our life plays out for us. Because the sign that is ruling your first house is going to control, is going to set the tone for the signs that is ruling your other 12 houses. And the 12 houses being different areas of life, so the first house really sets the way that you're going to meet the world in the different areas of your life. I hope I'm making sense, guys. So let's talk a little bit. So now I want to share a little bit about my own first house placements. So I have a Gemini rising 26 degrees, so pretty late degrees of a Gemini rising or ascendant. So Gemini rules my first house. And what I've learned from having a Gemini Ascendant rising is that knowledge is very important to me, all right? And when I approach any new situations in my life, it's always about what can I learn from this experience? What knowledge does this experience give to me? Right off the bat, <laughs> you know? Um, during the first kind of part of my life, when I was younger, these knowledge that I wanted was a little bit more superficial, all right? Gotta be honest here, I can be a little bit superficial um, in a sense that I just wanted, you know, to be pleasing to people. That Geminis can be a little bit like that. So the knowledge that I gained was very limited because I didn't want to, you know, um, take a risk in asking questions or gathering information that would cause unpleasant situations but as I grew throughout my life <laughs> um, I'm more willing to take risk to gather knowledge that might be a bit controversial or that would maybe challenge society, society a little bit the way that society thinks a little bit because I really want to figure out you know what is the truth behind certain situations what is the authenticity behind certain situations so yeah, this Gemini rising makes me curious in that sense. And um, when you're looking at your first house, the sign that rules your first house, you want to see the ruling planet of that sign and which house it's placed in, because that would tell you more about your rising sign. So Gemini rules, Mercury rules Gemini. So then I would look to see where Mercury is placed in my chart. And Mercury is in my 12th house, which is the house of, you know, otherworldliness, the house of spirituality, the house of um, just confusion, but also the house of timelessness and boundless possibilities. So when I approach new situations, yes, there is this knowledge that I want to gain from people, but at the same time, you know, I somehow managed to make ex the experiences in my life become a spiritual learning experience for some reason. Um, yeah, because Mercury is placed in the 12th house, obviously. So, you know, it, it doesn't really... I can be quite impersonal in a sense that I can just go into an experience just to learn something spiritual from it and then just remove myself from the situation because I've learned, you know, I've gained what I need to... I've gained the knowledge that I need to gain from that experience. But I've always managed to turn it into something that, you know, allows me to reflect 
more on myself, allows me to um, be a bit sentimental about the experience so that I can, you know, go deep deeper into the experience and really, you know, transform myself and make myself a better person. And that's what I try to do with each new experience. I feel like I'm saying experience a lot here. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what the rising sign is. How you experience things. Um, yeah, and so because Mercury is in my 12th house, this also makes me a less extroverted Gemini rising, <laughs> all right? So I'm not really like going to be very, I can be outgoing, but I'm an introvert. I'm a Gemini rising introvert. <laughs> so I've also got moon, the moon in my first house, but it is in a different sign. It is in Cancer, okay? Although my first house is ruled by Gemini, but a part of it, you know, is ruled by, is, it's not ruled by Cancer, but a part of it has some Cancerian qualities and the moon in Cancer is in my first house. So, am I emotional? Yes. <laughs> am I introspective? Very. Um, am I moody? Not gonna lie, can be moody. Am I intuitive about things? I can be intuitive about things. Um, so with having the moon in the house of the physical body, right? The first house is the physical body. When I, so what I've learned from this is that when I am stressed or when I am sad or when I'm frustrated with something, you know, whenever my emotions are triggered, oh, my whole body is triggered. You know, my, my stomach would be churning and I would feel like there's something stuck in my throat and my energy would be so low. It's like there's a thunderstorm going on inside my body. So when my emotions are triggered, there's a thunderstorm going inside, you know. Um, there's like a, a flood going on inside my body and I can't do much of anything, you know. The energy just whooshes away and I just have to like be in my room and cry. <laughs> Or just be in my room and drown in my emotions until I can come out of it. Then I can find the energy to do stuff again. Otherwise, ugh, it just... Oh, my stomach. <laughs> yeah, so with having a moon in the first house, this receptivity, this intuition can sometimes be a double-edged sword in a sense that sometimes I am too receptive to the point where I can be with somebody and if they're feeling bad or if they're feeling happy, you know, I'm feeling bad and I'm feeling happy and I don't know if it's you or if it's me, I just feel what you feel. <laughs> and it's a bit draining and that's why I am an introvert and I need a lot of time to just be in my own energy. <laughs> the other thing about having the moon here is also that I can also be very affected by the phases of the moon and I know this sounds a little cuckoo but it's true, you know, nearer to the new moon or the full moon, which happens about, you know, twice a month, there'll be one new moon and one full moon twice a month, oh, once a month. There'll be one new moon and one full moon every month. So during these times, it usually makes me very calm and very happy for some reason. It makes me happier than other times of the month. And I don't know, I just, feel enlightened by something, you know, I feel this profoundity within the air and the spaces around me and I feel comfortable at being by myself and just looking inwards and introspecting, you know, it's, I love to introspect and the new moon and the full moon enhances that love for introspection. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, guys. So, I also have my Mars, which is in Cancer, and my Chiron in Cancer conjunct my Ascendant. Not a close conjunction, but it's conjunct. It's within 9 to 10 degrees of my actual Ascendant. Um, so, a little a short story on my birth, birthing moment. Um, so, my mom had a C-section to um, give birth to me, and what happened was that the um, she was not she was given a local anesthesia so she wasn't 100% unconscious she was given a local anesthesia on the lower part of her body and the anesthesia 
after giving birth to me, you know, after the, the whole surgery is done, the anesthesia kind of wore off before it should for some reason. And she was in a lot of pain. Mars could drive the ascendant, causing my mom a lot of pain. Sorry, mom. <laughs> but yeah, that's as the story of how Mars conjunct the Ascendant has affected my mom. Um, also, with this placement of Mars and Chiron conjunct the Ascendant, people will say that, you know, you have been bullied. I'm not gonna lie. I've had some bullying experiences, which I'm gonna share them with you. They were not necessarily like severe bullying, but they were more of like being teased a lot. So, when I was younger, um, I think I was around 7 or 8 years old, there was this boy in school, alright? And he would bully me almost like every other day for a couple of years. He would steal my stuff, run around the school, and I had to go and chase after him, and things like that. You know, not necessarily very bad bullying, but just, I was the victim. Um, and I was not the only person who bullied me, there were a couple of other kids that would tease me and things like that and I would cry about it so a little bit of it is kind of true that you know with Mars and Chiron there you you could have been bullied a little bit and because the first house is the house of the physical appearance with Chiron there and Chiron being the wound the wounded healer later in life but it's, it's the wound so when I was much when I was younger I had this kind of wound with my physical appearance. <laughs> so the way that Chiron here played out was that when I was younger, all right, I didn't look like this way when it comes to my teeth. <laughs> so I was born with very strange teeth. I used to have more teeth than I should have. I had, well, I had this, but then I had two teeth up here, two, two teeth up here. And it just made me look like a bit like a vampire, so I had to have that teeth removed. But the bigger problem was that I had a jaw problem. You probably can't see it from the video, but when I chew food, my lower jaw would be uh, protruding above my upper jaw. So when I eat, look, this is my teeth, right? My lower jaw would go like that when I chew food. This is my upper jaw, this is my lower jaw. So my lower jaw would go like that when I chew food. Whereas with most people, it would be that way, right? I mean, you can try it out now. Just try to eat something and you'll see that you go like that. Whereas I go like that. So my parents took me to the dentist when I was younger. And the dentist said that um, at 18 years old, I had to have surgery. So I had to cut off my lower jaw and take some of the muscles and bones from there and add it to my upper jaw to make the upper jaw, you know, protrude out and make the lower jaw go in. You, you see what I mean? Oh god, it was like this, it was like a wound basically. It was this thing that, you know, made me feel that I was ugly. <laughs> and my parents were kind of going on and on about it, like, you know, throughout my teenage years at tan, it's gonna be time for you to have your jaw cut off and whatever, and I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah. Anyways, when time came, when I turned 18, the we went back to the dentist again, and the dentist said that there were a lot of complications and risk involved in this procedure, that, you know, there's a risk that, you know, my lower jaw would be numb for the rest of my life. There was a very high chance that that could happen. So we decided that we wouldn't go through with it because the risk was too high. So I'm still eating like this right now and it hasn't really affected me in, you know, how I digest food or anything. It's just maybe it was disturbing for my parents to see every day. Who knows? And there was also this thing about my skin. Oh, like you see this skin color, all right, is considered by Thai people to be dark. Darker than what you see on TV and darker than a lot of other people. So I was teased a lot about having dark skin. My friends would give me names and things. But, you know, having Mars here, opposite Uranus, don't really care. <laughs> I eventually got over it, all right? Obviously, 
but when I was much younger, I really thought that I was ugly. You know, I had this thing in my head where it's kind of like, ugh, I'm just not beautiful, I'm just ugly, I'm just, I have all these flaws in my physical appearance, blah, 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 blah. But what really changed was when I started to travel and I started going abroad. And what I found out through these experiences was that the beauty standard is so different around the world, you know, and although I may be ugly, in Thailand, I was never perceived as being ugly in other countries, in any other countries around the world. So I was actually quite surprised by this, you know. Obviously, I was traveling for other reasons, like work and stuff like that. But, you know, what came with it was like my colleagues saying, Oh, like, do you, um, did you talk to that beautiful Thai teacher? Or did you talk to that beautiful new teacher? And my students would be like, oh, teacher, you're so beautiful and things. And I'd be like, you know, pretty shocked and pretty surprised. And I think in a way, you know, that made me see things a little differently about what beauty actually is. And it made me realize that I would never ever judge anyone for anything for the way that they look, never, ever. And nobody should ever judge anybody for the way that they look, because they can't change that, because that's the way they were born. Oh, okay, and the last thing that I want to talk about with Mars being in this first house, oh, there's so much to say, guys, is that my personality can be a little overwhelming for people. Not gonna lie, I mean, obviously most of the time it can be a little calm and stuff because I am a Taurus, but with Mars here, when I get excited and when I want to say something, when I have an opinion about something, I can be a little overwhelming. Which I know that I probably have to tone down a little bit, but sometimes I just don't want to. Mars opposite Uranus. Um, anyways, yeah, what I find is that I tend to get along more better with people who have a lot of fire and air in their chart because I don't entirely dominate those people, you know, we can kind of get along. But when I'm with people who have more water and earth, it becomes that I'm, I'm dominating over them and I tend to say things that really make them feel bad. But when I'm with these fiery and airy people, when I say stuff, it's being received back and forth and they don't necessarily take it too personally. But the funny thing is that I don't have any fire in my chart, that's the thing. I'm all water, earth, and air. So I should actually get along better with people who have earth and water. But, you know, that's my take on the first house and my experiences of my first house placements. Of course, I would love to know what you've got going on in your first house because I love this house. You know, I'm all about self-awareness guys that's why we have this channel so that we can be more self-aware and have better relationships with other people when we're more self-aware so please leave a comment below what your rising sign is what planets do you have in your first house and what have been your experiences with those placements and if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel please click the red subscribe button below if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and if you're already subscribed then thank you very much for watching this video <laughs> and I will see you very soon guys. Bye-bye!